Welcome. Welcome, everyone. Welcome back. Or welcome if you're just joining us for the first time to this conference, the Global Embrace or Widening Reach or Deepening Connection. We have a very special presentation today that has to do with widening our reach. The last two days, we've taken some time to reflect on contemplative outreach and to deepen our connection to this growing organism. 
hearing from some of our founding members on Thursday was a time of gratitude for me for this deep history and with this special emphasis on our founder, Thomas. And then the presentation with Mary Jane and Kathleen and Brian helped us to deepen our connection around the vision for who we are and how as an organism we function. We also heard from Julie Sad, who shared beautifully on how this prayer deepens our connection to God to, and, and also transforms all of our relationships. You know, Julie reminded us of our basic core of goodness and that the practice brings us deeper into that core, which is God herself. And when I first started practicing Centering Prayer, I was very interested in this idea of the basic core of goodness and union with God. And my focus was about me. How's my relationship with God? How do I get closer? How do I love more? And I was really trying to appreciate my own basic core of goodness. It was kind of a self-help program. As important as that was for me to appreciate my own core of goodness, Julie helped me affirm for me that the teaching is not about my core of goodness. It's about our core of goodness. And that we can't be in love with God without being in love with everyone else. And it isn't love unless it extends out to embrace the whole world with no exceptions. Thomas Merton says this beautifully in his book, The Wisdom of the Desert. He says, all through the writings of the elders, we find a repeated insistence on the primacy of love over everything else in the spiritual life, over knowledge, over gnosis, over asceticism, over contemplation, solitude, and prayer. Love, in fact, is the spiritual life, and without it, all the other exercises of spirit, however lofty, are emptied of content and become mere illusions. And the more lofty they are, the more dangerous the illusion. It's a good reminder, and our focus today is on widening our reach and extending that love to everyone. And we have this very special lineup of speakers who are going to share the love by bringing this prayer to particular groups of people. We'll hear from four different interest groups and service teams as a means of highlighting this important emphasis on the work and on the prayer. The first group we'll hear from are young contemplatives, though, and then we'll also hear from those who are working with those who are incarcerated and formerly incarcerated. We'll hear from a, a service team who's working with those in recovery from addiction. And then finally, we'll hear about senior contemplatives. So let's begin by hearing about some of this wonderful work going on with young contemplatives. Allow me to introduce them to you now. The 40s and Under initiative is about forming community among younger generations of contemplatives. Through offering online centering prayer groups and retreat weekends to deepen the practice, the 40s and Under initiative aims to connect young contemplat contemplatives that are already practicing centering prayer. Online introductory workshops are also offered to introduce the methods, method of centering prayer to those without knowledge or experience of it. This group also aims to collect the writings of the participants in centering prayer and related to these themes of interest of the younger generation and put these writings into different formats to be shared with the community. So let me introduce to you now the two reps from that this particular initiative. First, we have Colleen Thomas, who is a spiritual director and television producer with an MA in theology and art from Fuller Theological Seminary. Based in Los Angeles, she's founder and curator of Soul Care LA, an urban monastery, offering spiritual companionship for enterprising artists, entertainers, and, and, and the entertainment prof professionals. She'll also be uh, 
for sharing this segment with Keith Christich, who is a commission presenter of Centering Prayer and leader of the online contemplative community called Closer Than Breath, which offers regular monthly contemplative retreats and live courses to deepen the practice of Centering Prayer. Keith is a spiritual director, Enneagram teacher, and coach to those looking to weave contemplative awareness with the psychological insights of the Enneagram. Keith aims to help people slow down and reconnect their true selves through contemplation, meditation, and the Enneagram. And now with great pleasure, I hand this over to Colleen and Keith. Thank you, Mark. It's such a joy and an honor to be here and um, to be sharing this presentation with Keith, um, who really invited me into this community. And um, I would say fitting to um, our topic, which is younger contemplatives, Keith and I actually met on Instagram as the kids do these days. <laughs> so um, we're Instagram buddies and who share a common uh, vision and passion for contemplative prayer, uh, centering prayer in particular, um, and a deep desire to see others who look like us um, in these rooms and in these communities. <clears throat> um, I felt like I wanted to begin with a um, particular perspective on the history of centering prayer um, as I was thinking about how I could add to this presentation with Keith, um, it dawned on me that at one time, <clears throat> Father Keating was himself a 40s and under. Um, you know, um, as the, the history goes, um, he and others living at St. Joseph's Abbey in Spencer, Massachusetts, uh, were inspired by the decree of decree of Vatican II. Um, at that time, in I believe 1962, Father Keating would have been 34 years old, um, and uh, inspired by uh, a challenge to bring this contemplative practice to a larger community. Um, a few years later, uh, in 1968, the Beatles uh, took off for India um, to study TM, Transcendental Meditation. Um, and Father Keating would have been 45 years old at that age. So still technically a 40s and under. Um, and I think that's interesting um, to the origin of how we all came to be invited into this practice. Um, because in a way, um, as Father Keating and um, William Menninger and Basil Pennington were noticing this movement of young people into Spencer, Massachusetts to a nearby Buddhist meditation center. Um, in a way, they're offering this practice and thinking of how to offer this practice was indeed inspired by young, contempl young contemplatives. Um, it was younger, a younger generation at that time in the 60s and 70s that were seeking something that they knew um, had roots also in our Christian faith. And um, I think we all do well to, um, to, to consider that. And, um, to, and we're in, we find ourselves in a similar place now that they might have been with how do we do this? <clears throat> how do we offer this old way to a new generation? Um, but we might begin to consider how to with remembering what drew us to this practice, because at some point, uh, like Father Keating, we were all 
40s and under. Um, and uh, one of the things that Keith and I talked about was that perhaps in our breakout sessions today, we can consider with one another um, ourselves years ago. Um, we came up with the name 40s and under because at the time that we were talking, I was 39. So I was just about to be 40. And if we'd said 40 and under uh, or, or under 40, I would have been cut off. <laughs> so um, and 40 still gives us an opportunity to see people born on that cusp. You know, my birth date year is 1980, which when I tell people that sometimes I get this, oh my gosh, <laughs> reaction, because it sounds like yesterday. Um, I was not alive through the 60s and 70s, um, but many of you in this community were. And so um, I think I just want to extend a, a simple invitation to you all today as you hear more about uh, more from Keith about what we are doing with this vision for our 40s and under initiative to remember your time in the 60s and 70s, what you were longing for, what drew you to centering prayer, what drew you to the contemplative life. Um, and that might offer us some insight as to how to um, appeal to a younger generation so that we might carry on the tradition of Father Keating. Um, and also this afternoon, I know we'll be hearing from those who gathered in Snowmass um, in 2017 at the behest of uh, Father Keating and others um, who prior to his death um, sensed the importance of identifying and leaving this tradition um, in the hands of those who could carry it on. And so while Keith and I were not at that gathering and um, I never had the privilege of meeting Father Keating, I consider him a, a, a spiritual father and, and mentor and um, am grateful to be in this community and family um, practicing centering prayer with you all and um, learning from you all, le really learning from you all and, um, and, and using the knowledge that I gain to inspire others. So with that, I will pass it off to Keith so that he can give you a lot more context about what we have been doing and what we will, uh, what we hope to do. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Colleen. Um, so good to hear those words and a true honor to be working with you and Mark and others on this, this project here. So thank you. Um, and to be really clear, to be working on this infant of a project, very much a baby of a project. This has just been months in the making where we have a couple online groups, which you'll hear about in a few minutes. But just to be clear, this is this is really brand new in many ways and could use the support of, of you listening here. Uh, which we'll get into at the end. I'd like to, um, I'll sort of speak through sort of the three pillars of the project, sort of the vision of, of where we're going, not quite where we are, but where we're going, um, talk about where we are currently, and then just a few small ways that you might even be of a help. Um, but to start, the overarching vision is really about creating contemplative community for younger generations. Um, I know I've been facilitating a, a centering prayer group for eight years, and often it's I've been leading contemplative workshops, retreats, weekly groups, and most people are twice my age. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. I enjoy it. I love it. Um, but it is very nice when there's younger faces and, um, you know, people in similar circumstances. And I'm sure you've had young people frequent your centering prayer groups or retreats and workshops. Um, coming in and coming out. And so this is really fundamentally about creating space for young contemplatives that are sharing similar life situations, sharing, um, li living in certain, in the same life stages, um, living in certain similar life styles um, and bringing those contemplatives together. So that that's sort of at the base of this. Um, sort of the three ways that this is, uh, we're looking at this is around 
Uh, creating contemplative prayer groups and weekend retreats and workshops for those that are already practicing centering prayer. There's certainly already young contemplatives, 40s and under. And by that, as, as Colleen said, 40s means 49 and under. Um, don't worry, we don't ID people in the Zoom room if you want to come in. <laughs> but we are um, trying to create a certain kind of community, and there's certainly already people practicing. So in one sense, our work is just about connecting the dots. There's a centering prayer young person in Hawaii that practices alone, that's never practiced with another group before. And so finally, an invitation to join other young contemplatives um, in this journey. So it's really about creating those groups. Currently, we just have two. I'd like to see four in two months. I'd like to see six in four months. I'd love to see 12 um, by the end of 2022, for example. Um, so it's about creating more groups, creating more leaders uh, that are able to facilitate these groups so that they're not only for young people, but they're also led by young people. Um, it's not just young people going to groups, but it's about the leadership, uh, a contemplative outreach, giving the skills of facilitator training and giving young people the tools um, and skill set that they need to facilitate these groups themselves. Um, so that's the first pillar, sort of connecting the contemplatives that are already floating around but are disconnected from, from one another. Uh, the second is creating opportunities for new people, perhaps for contemplatives that don't even know they're contemplatives, perhaps for that 30-year-old in Pennsylvania that likes to spend a quiet morning over a cup of coffee in the silence and quiet and doesn't have a practice to sort of engage the silence with. Um, so this is what contemplative outreach does, right? Promoting the practice of centering prayer, um, doing introductory workshops to either refresh people's practice or to introduce people that have never heard of centering prayer before, um, be, just by circumstance. And so this is about creating online workshops, um, introductory workshops that are specifically geared to young people. Again, ideally led by young people. We haven't been able to do this, although the the mission statement that Mark read earlier says, we are running uh, introductory programs. We haven't done that. We will be doing that. Um, but again, it's about giving them the resources, preparing young people to be the leaders themselves, to present those and to present it to people that are new to the practice. And certainly people are, are hungry for this. Young people are hungry for spirituality, for depth spirituality, for contemplative spirituality, for an intimate relationship with the divine. And so they're there. Um, it's just about reaching them in new ways. For example, on social media or as Instagram, as Colleen says, there's lots of avenues in ways that we didn't have Instagram and Facebook 30 years ago to, to create contemplative offerings or connect with people in those ways. Um, so that's the second piece is offering the, the contemplative prayer to others that are unfamiliar with the practice. Uh, the third sort of piece of this initiative is around um, sharing the writing of Centering Prayer by young people. There's younger generations that are writers, there's younger uh, people that um, are practicing Centering Prayer and also happen to be writing about the spiritual life. And so one of the goals is to create some sort of um, young contemplatives column, uh, perhaps under the contemplative outreach umbrella that would be shared uh, to the contemplative outreach community as a way to promote um, you know, writings of young people. I'm thrilled when I find out um, new books are coming out on Centering Prayer. Just last year, Lindsay Boyer and uh, um, Rich Lewis wrote two new books on Centering Prayer. Maybe you know this week there's a brand new book on Centering Prayer. I'm not, a, the author is Dr. Brian something. I don't even know his last name, but there's a brand new book on Centering Prayer coming out this week. Um, and so I'm thrilled when there's more writings on Centering Prayer coming out that it's not just going to be Thomas Keating and Cynthia Bourgeau and David Frenette, and then we're just not going to have any more, but the, the writing would continue. And so part of this is about lifting up the voices of young people that are practicing centering prayer around themes that are interesting to young people. So I think of themes around social justice, centering prayer and social justice, centering prayer and social action. What does the contemplative voice have to say to the Black Lives Matter movement or to climate change or any number of major uh, social issues. What is the contemplative voice and what's the centering prayer message in those? Or what is the relationship to centering prayer and mindfulness? We're inundated with mindfulness and young people as well. Even in our workspaces, mindfulness is, is being promoted. And so 
that's a super wonderful thing, but what is the distinction? What is centering prayer just Christian mindfulness or not? Is it somewhat distinct? And so looking at different themes that are specifically interested to young people and then promoting the writing of young people themselves. So um, those, those are the three sort of pillars, um, creating the space, connecting the dots or centering prayer practitioners that are young, that are already practicing. Second, bringing new people into the practice. And then third, creating writing um, around themes that are interesting to young people um, from the voice of young people in the hopes of perhaps gathering those writings to publish a book. In the sense, there's been many, uh, few centering prayer books that are collections of different writers together. Um, so that's sort of the overarching vision. I'll speak to the, um, currently we just have two groups that run. Um, Colleen and I both run groups. We've intentionally ran those in the evening, which is when uh, young people seem to be a little bit more uh, available to, to meet at that time. And so we've had 80 people sign up for those groups. Um, certainly 80 people don't come to those two groups. That would be probably too big. Um, but we, have, we do have 80 people that have, with interest, signed up for those. And we aim to continue to create more groups as we create more facilit group facilitators. Um, also in the chat, they're going to drop our link. Thank you. Uh, that's a link that you can share. So I'll end just sharing very simply three ways that you can really support uh, the first is to share that sign up page. It was dropped in the chat there. So if you know young people that are already doing centering prayer or are interested in creating contemplative community, share that link with them. It's very simple for them to sign up. Um, and both our contact, Colleen and I, are, are on that. And so please promote that. Um, feel free to connect us with other young leaders. If you know somebody that's 40 that, want, that runs a centering prayer group or has thought about running a centering prayer group, uh, connect them to us. If you know a centering prayer person that's also a writer um, that loves writing, connect them to us because we want to reach these people that are already actively in these worlds. And then the third, you can email Colleen and I. My email is very, I don't, I guess I don't know Colleen's email by heart, but mine is just Keith at KeithKristich.com. So if you know my name, um, that's my email address. Um, so you can please reach out and email us um, as, as you know people within this within this network. Um, and I think that does it. Um, Mark, back over to you. <laughs> thank you, Colleen and Keith, uh, for this important work that you're doing. And thank you for uh, letting us in on it as well. Uh, let me just... Now we want to hear from uh, the prison outreach service team. Um, and I'll just say a, a, a couple words about the, the team and then introduce you to our first speaker. So the Contemplative Outreach Prison Outreach Service Team was formed this past spring. It aims to facilitate the practice of centering prayer among people affected by incarceration, both through direct support and by supporting volunteers who share the prayer inside locked facilities. We're delighted to have um, a, a few people from this team here today. I'll just introduce the first person and he'll introduce the rest of the team to you as they go through. I'm, I'm delighted to introduce you to Hampton Deck. He's the pastor of the First Presbyterian Church in, uh, in California where he has served for 26 plus years. He's been the leader of a centering prayer group at the California Healthcare Facility Prison in Stockton, California, every Thursday morning since 2018. Hampton started going into Folsom State Prison as a volunteer in the centering prayer group there in the spring of 2016. He's had a daily centering prayer practice for over 10 years. He's a, he is a trained introductory centering prayer workshop presenter, and he has attended 10-day silent retreats in Snowmass, Colorado annually since 2014. So I happily turn this over to Hampton. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Mark. Um, we just like to give you a little taste of what it's like to uh, do centering prayer with those in prison. Um, I never intended to go into prison, but I had a friend 
been to three different prisons to pray with groups there. And that made me curious. And so um, some years ago, I felt called by God to go with her into prison. And so as Mark said, in the spring of 2016, I began driving 90 minutes from Vallejo up to Folsom to go into Folsom State Prison. The group there is led by um, Ray Leonardini, who founded and leads the organization Prison Contemplative Fellowship. And Ray has created lots of resources to help both prisoners and those who go in to pray with them. Um, next month, his latest resource, a documentary film called Holding Still will make its debut. And so right now we'd like to show you the trailer of that film. And um, you can also register, there'll be information in the next slide about how you can register to see the debut of the film on October 20th. Once I get trapped in my emotions and I'm not careful, my thoughts run wild. Before anything can make me feel any kind of way, whatever the circumstances call for, if it just calls for anger, anger. If it calls for violence, violence. I blew it. There was so much shame. Our brokenness, our shame is controlling the internal narrative that we have, which influences our behavior. My thoughts, my thoughts would tell me all kind of crazy things about life, about what someone did, about the past, about me wanting revenge, about what I need to do to make things right. We're talking about something that is so painful, it's killing you. And that's what's so liberating about centering prayer and learning how to sit still with yourself is that you have a space now where you could look at your thoughts and say, what the fuck am I thinking? What the fuck is that? No, nah, that's not right. And it leads you to better decisions. I mean, it's, it's magical for me because it's God healing you but in his own language, and God's language for me is silence, but it's a silence that really says something to you. I remember after I had been going into Folsom State Prison for a few months, asking one of the men I met there if I could share with my congregation what I was learning from him. Of course, he quickly replied. In fact, if people in your congregation have questions for me, you can bring them to me on Monday nights and I'll tell you the answer. So the next Sunday, I stood up in the pulpit and told my congregation about his offer to answer their questions. And after of course, it was over. One lady came up to me and she said, I have a question for your friend in prison. I was kind of excited she had a question, but I wasn't really ready for what she said, because what she said was, what I want to know is if the people in prison are sorry for what they did that put them in prison. So the next evening when I got to the prison chapel, I sought out my friend and I said, I told my congregation you would answer their questions. And one lady has a question for you, but I want you to know this is not my question. It's her question. I already know the answer to this question. Well, what's her question, he said. Well, she wants to know if you're sorry for what you did that put you in prison, I rather sheepishly told him. And he very calmly looked me in the eye and he said, 
I understand. I totally understand. Please tell her from me that I am very, very deeply sorry for what I did, and I know that I can never make up for it either. I wouldn't be in this centering prayer group if I weren't sorry for what I did. Of course, I already knew that, but I didn't know, and I wasn't prepared for what he told me next. He said, but you need to know what happened in my life that led me to commit my crime. You see, my parents split when I was a toddler. I ended up living with my mom who made methamphetamine. So from the time I was two years old, I literally grew up in a meth lab in the apartment I lived in. And my mom not only made meth, she was a junkie. She used meth and she sold meth. And when she couldn't do that, she prostituted herself to make money. And so I didn't get very much love from my mother growing up. She didn't pay very much attention to me. And I never knew when I would get my next meal. And I didn't have any friends either because everybody in the neighborhood knew what was going on for, in the apartment I lived in because they saw the dealers and the junkies coming and going. Now, as he continued this, telling me the story of his young life, it was extremely hard for me to tell, to hear what he was telling me. And if you looked at me while he continued to tell me the nightmare of his childhood, you would have seen me standing there intently looking into his eyes shaking, nodding my head as he told me these things. But what was happening inside me was quite different. Inside me, I had fallen to the floor, stunned and staggered by what he was calmly telling me because it didn't match the intelligent, kind, deeply insightful man standing in front of me. And the overwhelming thought that kept running through my mind as he talked was, if I had grown up like him, I'd probably be in prison too. And over the last five and a half years, I've realized that every prisoner who's told me their story has a story like that. So going into prison to pray centering prayer with others has impacted me very deeply. I've been inspired by what I've witnessed and the absolutely amazing transformation that God has worked through centering prayer in the lives of the people I've met in prison. And it's taught me a lot about myself. It's exposed my pride, my judgmentalism, my privilege, my ignorance. But it's also expanded and deepened my capacity for understanding, for compassion, for caring, and for love. By calling me to go into prison to pray with those I've met there, God has, trans has shown me how God has transformed both their lives and how God is continuing to transform me more deeply. Perhaps God is calling you to this experience. But at this time, I'd like to turn it over to one of my friends, Lawrence Hamilton, who I met in Folsom State Prison and who you just met on the film we just watched. Lawrence. Thank you, Anthony. It's a real honor to be here because I really believe that this practice has the potential for transforming the whole world that we live in. I came to center in prayer by walking the yard with a friend of mine that I watched over a period of time turn into a more caring and compassionate person. And I realized that when I walked in the chapel that it was because people cared enough to volunteer. Over 25 years ago, a guy named Mike Kelly was a student of Thomas Kidding, brought Center in Prayer to Folsom Prison. And his friend, Al Franklin, they kept the doors open to finally a teacher who was my teacher, my mentor, and my friend, who was before mentioned, Ray Neil Darnini. I'm not pushing his name. <laughs> I've been knowing him so many years, I still can't get that. But what I'm saying is, he was the first one that told me you can have an intimate relationship with God. And I was hooked from that point. I was intrigued. And I realized that through this practice, that's exactly what you can get. When you sit in silence and those afflictive thoughts and emotions that used to drive you to react in all kinds of strange ways just float by. And in that silence, you can listen to the voice of God who speaks to you in silence. A transformation occurs. I have seen have not seen anyone that came to that 
session to that practice that did not experience transformation. And I realized that it's because of volunteers. So I would encourage anyone, I believe if you're here at this conference, you are called. And if you volunteer and go in, you are chosen. And I would just like to say that I know that uh, I listen to these um, verses of the Bible where the guy goes to the gate and he says, let me in. And they said, no, you can't come in. I don't know you. And he says, why? He says, because I was in poverty and you didn't feed and clothe me. I was brokenhearted and you didn't come for me. And I was in prison and you didn't come see me. And he says, well, when did I do that? He says, when you did it to the least of mine, you did it to me. So I would encourage anyone that has this calling to just um, follow the spirit that leads you. Because like uh, Hampton said, a lot of us that have been impacted by the way society is and the way that we've been brought up, um, you know, we've experienced a lot of difficulties. And there's something about this practice that really helps bring about transformation. I have a quote by Thomas Keating. He said, to be in the kingdom is to participate in God's solidarity with the poor by sharing with them the good things that we have been given to us. In the New Testament, the great sin is to be deaf to the cry of the poor, whether that cry springs from emotional, material, or spiritual need. Although we cannot help but partake in some degree of social injustice because we live in this world, we must constantly reach out in concrete and practical ways to those in need. Divine love is not a feeling, but a choice. And with that, I'd like to pass it on to Ket, who was in the Center of Prayer group with me in Folsom. Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Ket. I'm a little nervous right now, so if I messed up, I apologize. I wanted to give you a little brief history about myself. I was 16 years old when I went to prison. And I was just released about a year ago after doing 25 years straight. It's a, um, it's a shameful part of my past that I regret. Growing up, I was a troubled kid. And throughout the majority of my life, I suffered from self-hatred, anxiety, depression, and just rage. I never knew how to, to deal with my emotions. Each time I would feel overwhelmed, I would either hit myself in the face or either resort to violence, gangs, drugs, and criminal behavior. I heard so many people. There came a point in my life where I was just tired of being afraid. I was tired of like waking up every single morning and feeling like a piece of shit, not caring whether I lived or died. Like it hurt so much to live. I was desperate. And to be honest, I was even suicidal. And that's how I came across Centering Prayer. A group of friends of mine, they introduced me to it. They encouraged me to go. I can't remember what my first reaction was, but I, I think I remember I was like, what the fuck is Centering Prayer? I remember me saying that. And looking back now, it it's probably one of the best decisions I ever made in my life. Centering prayer, it gave me and others like me a tool. I have a practice now that allows me to go into a place within myself and sit still with my emotions, something that I didn't never knew how to do before. And that leads me to make better decisions. 
I think throughout this whole process, what I came to realize through this practice was that the greatest treasure was sitting still was that I came to find God. God was there all along waiting for me. He was everywhere. He was in people and situations and things, but I know now why I could never see those things in my life because I was so trapped up in my own demons. I never would have gotten to this point had it never not been for my sponsors, Ray and everyone else who came day in and day out for Christmas, for New Year's Eve, for Thanksgiving, they sacrificed their free time to come see me and that meant a lot to me. That showed me that, you know what? People weren't broken, people weren't suspect, life wasn't broken. They believed in me and eventually I started to believe in myself. I really appreciate them. I have so much gratitude for them but I know that all these things would have never came full circle had I not found God within. For me, God is more than just books. He's more than just scripture. For me, God is spiritual and I can't find God. I can't be connected to God if I have no place to go to and that's within. Thank you. Thank you, Kat. And thank you, Lawrence. And thank you, Hampton. Beautiful witnesses, all of them. My name is Chandra Hansen, and I too have a beautiful witness, but my job this morning isn't to share that. It's to tell you a little bit about the newly formed prison outreach service team. Prison outreach, as you've heard, Kat mentioned Mike Kelly, is not new in contemplative outreach. It's been going on for decades. And some of those original volunteers are still doing it. Um, Father Keating's made several visits to prisons in California. And you can see beautiful footage of those visits on our website, which will be posted later. Many, many practitioners of Centering Prayer have participated in the rich and fruitful exchange that Lawrence and Ket and Hampton have described. So prison outreach is not new, but this service team has just recently started up again. It, it has existed in the past, but this iteration of it is new in the last few months. We're just getting started. And it's born out of the partnership between contemplative outreach and prison contemplative fellowship, the organization that Ray Leonardini founded and that produced the, the short film that we saw this morning. And as Hampton mentioned, many, many other fantastic resources that all of us benefit from. So we really need to give a great deal of credit to Ray and to, to PCF, Prison Contemplative Fellowship. Ray has, um, in addition to those materials, he's also mentored countless numbers of us who volunteer. He's helped us spend hours on the phone, helped different people kind of get over the hurdles that are involved with getting started doing this inside a prison. He was um, I, I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing if it weren't for Ray, that's for sure. So great, great thanks to Ray Leonardini. But I also need to express deep gratitude to the governing board of contemplative outreach and to the organizers of this conference four years ago. At that time, they were making a big shift in how the conference is run. Many of you know this and have been to conferences before and since. They were making the shift to that grassroots model to collaborative listening. We had um, small groups in the tables and they very intentionally reached out to Ray and included prison volunteers in that process, seeing it as an important voice and an important aspect of the community. So those of you who were at that conference in 2017 might remember there were about a dozen of us prison volunteers who were there. We ended up being basically one at each of the small group tables and we did our best to represent the voice of our friends who were inside the prisons and unable to join us in person. We also spent lots of time meeting together and making connections. I know for me and for a number of us, that was the first time I'd ever met another volunteer who was taking centering prayer into the prisons. So 
that conference really was the beginning of the service team. It was an incredible experience. Um, I mean, it's always good to be together at these conferences and to share, especially when we can do it in person, to share our stories and our experiences and our journeys. But especially in the prison context, there's something so isolating about prison. And, and even the volunteers, I mean, we don't experience it like the prisoners do, but we, we participate in that. And so to be able to share those experiences was just, it was really life-changing. And several of us left that conference determined to stay in touch and to keep figuring out ways that we could support one another. So there were immediate fruits in those connections, but there were also seeds planted at that time that would grow and germinate in time. Initially, we focused on sharing our experiences in writing and getting things into the voice and the newsletter. We came to recognize the growing importance of that, the print newsletter that comes out twice a year because you know, for folks who have a centering prayer group in the prison, like Lawrence and Kett did, that's one thing. But there are also lots and lots of prisoners at facilities who don't have access to that. And that newsletter can be a lifeline for them. It's really the only way that they can stay connected to contemplative community. So there was a growing recognition of that and a very generous response from the board, again, to help make sure that that would happen. And then in the spring of 2020, um, shortly after Mary Jane Yates, became the administrator, she and Marie Howard and I had a phone conversation to try to figure out, okay, maybe what, what next? And Marie invoked Pat Johnson's famous saying, need determines function. And she helped me to understand that, that what we do here in contemplative outreach isn't a top-down answer. We don't go to the administrator and say, what are we gonna do about this? Instead, we survey the people who are doing the volunteering and ask, what are the needs? So let's find out. So it was one of those phone conversations where you sort of think, gosh, you better watch out what you ask for. Because by, by the time I hung up the phone, I had been appointed prison outreach liaison and tasked with coming up with the survey. So it was, uh, the ball was in motion and launched and the survey went out in the winter of 2021, just last January, late January, I think. And it was beautiful to see the responses start pouring in. We ended up hearing from 88 people in total. And you can see all the details of that on our website if you want more information. But the bottom line was just as at that conference, there was really this powerful, strong desire for networking. And so uh, we put out a request to the people who had responded to the survey asking for help kind of digging deeper and understanding how might we meet those needs. And the people who volunteered are now that we became the service team. So there are, um, there are a handful of us who are continuing to seek to listen deeply to the needs of the volunteers and the prisoners and the former prisoners and everybody who's affected by incarceration. And our hope is to be able to just to continue to leverage the gifts of the organism to meet those needs. So if you've heard anything today that piques your interest, We'd love to have you join us in this effort. Um, the tech team is putting up a document that will also be available to download. It's got just a few suggestions of ways to get started with us. Um, you know, as, as has been mentioned, this is a ministry of presence and it matters to go inside and sit in a circle with folks who are incarcerated. It, it matters for them, it matters for us. At the same time, there are lots of ways in the second part of that handout shows different ways that you might be able to get involved from the comfort of your own home if you don't feel called to go into prison. Um, right now we have two very active working groups and others that are getting started as we determine those needs, um, but we will always have groups working on corresponding directly with prisoners. We get letters from prisoners and we have some, you know, there's some tricky things about figuring out how to have correspondence with prisoners. So we have a group of people who are working on that. And then we have a group that's working on the volunteer support end of things. And right now they're hosting monthly gatherings over Zoom to share ideas, talk about challenges. Um, some of them will be topical. Some of them will just be you know, general support sessions. And we welcome people who aren't yet volunteering, but who are interested in volunteering to those sessions as well. So all of us who've gotten involved in prison outreach are pretty convinced of the value of this form of service not just for the folks that we serve, but for our own spiritual growth, as you've heard, and really for the growth of the body. So thank you.
Thank you to all of you, to you, Hampton. Uh, thank you, Lawrence. Thank you, Ket. And thank you, Chandra, um, for sharing your experience, for your vulnerability and sharing it, and also for the inspiration of the work that you're doing to continue to carry this message to others. We now want to hear from the uh, 12 step outreach group. The 12 step outreach uses the teachings of Thomas Keating and presents them in 12 step language. The mission for the, uh, the team is to, um, it reads, we are 12 step people who practice centering prayer as our 11th step and pass it on to others who are in 12 step recovery. We have two representatives from the team with us today to share a little bit about what's happening with that group. Uh, the first one is Jenny Adamson, who's been practicing Centering Prayer for 21 years and has been part of the 12-step outreach service team since it was organized in, tw in 2005. She's a commission presenter and currently serves on the governing board and as a living flame presenter. Jenny has served retreats in Snowmass in the Midwest and in Iceland and Ireland. She now lives in Carbondale, Colorado near Snowmass and is the chapter coordinator for the Roaring Fork Valley. We also have Jim McElroy, who's been practicing Centering Prayer since 1996 and has been a commission presenter since 2002. Jim has been on the leadership team of 12 Step Outreach since its formation in 2005 and is especially interested in teaching contemplative outreach. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, interested in teaching contemplative practices to the recovery community. He's a former coordinator of the contemplative outreach of St. Louis, is on the welcoming prayer faculty, and is a member of the Living Flame teaching team. I'm delighted that both Jenny and Jim are here with us today. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Mark. And I also want to say thank you to Carol and to Chris and um, to Maddie, <laughs> who are our support team, sometimes invisible to the rest of you, but have been doing such a great job. And I think I can say for for Jim as well, that we are so honored to be in this presentation with those of you who've gone before us. Um, and I, the prison ministry has always been close to our hearts because we serve so many of the same people. Um, and I want to say to Lawrence and Kat, it's just, I'm deeply honored to share this with you and for Chandra in Hamilton, it's so nice to hear you as well, and Keith and Colleen. So about 20 years ago, I went on a retreat and I met Madeline Sue, who was a 12-step person serving the retreat. And Jim McElroy was in St. Louis, this was in Iowa, and Jim McElroy was in St. Louis and he met Donald Masters, who was a 12-step person serving a retreat in St. Louis. Those were two of our pioneers in the 12 step um, movement to bring centering prayer to people in recovery. And in 2005, um, a group of us were invited to Snowmass by Donald Masters and, and Susan, and I'm sorry, Donald Masters and Madeline Sue. We were all um, invited, we were, we were all in 12 step recovery we were all presenters of Centering Prayer in the regular method. Um, and we were invited so that we could start a program to reach people in our language with 12-step language um, to teach them to present Thomas Keating's teachings on Centering Prayer. Now, some of you are very familiar with 12-step programs, but we use that language a lot and we forget to tell people what it means. Um, the 12 Steps was started in 1935 by two men, Bill and Bob, who were wanting to reach out to um, alcoholics who at that time were kind of a lost uh, cause for most people. And they developed the program of, of Alcoholics Anonymous, which is a spiritual path to help people connect with um, 
the God of their understanding. And it has expanded so that today there are millions of people involved in 12-step recovery programs for a number of different things. You know, Richard Rohr says everybody is an addict of some kind and Thomas Keating believed that as well. But at the same time, many of us are sicker than others and some of us need a continual 12-step um, uh, program and going to meetings and so on even after we um, put down the addiction of our choice. So the 12-step language um, does not divine, de define the deity for anyone. It is a spiritual path and it hopes to connect people to a God of their understanding, but it doesn't say you have to believe in this particular manifestation of God or in a Christian God. So by the time we got to Snowmass in 2005, Thomas Keating had already gone to Folsom Prison. He made a film about that. Um, so he understood, and you know, Ray, like, Ray has a book out called Toxic Shame, which is really worth reading. Um, he understood the toxic shame that, that goes with addiction and with people who have been in prison and how that can interfere with their relationship with a higher power who is loving. And he had also had the 20 years, Mark mentioned the book, The Common Heart yesterday. And, and by the time that we, met with Thomas in 2005, he had already been involved in the Snowmass Conference and the, uh, for the 20 years when they came up with those principles that were common to all faith practices and religions. So he had a real enlightenment and was very supportive of what, of what we were trying to do. And it was at a time when uh, contemplative outreach as a whole was teaching, um, was presenting the intro workshop in a very rigid way. We had to follow the script exactly. But Thomas supported us in creating our own script in 12-step language. And we used the, the analogy that this is, this is like people speaking a, a different language. If you were Spanish and you didn't understand English, let's reach out to you and teach you in your language. And so that's what we were doing with the 12 step community. And that's what the um, support that, that Thomas Keating gave us was so meaningful to all of us. And I remember one of the evenings that we were there in 2005 and we were sitting around on the floor in the prayer room and Thomas was sitting in his chair being the sage that he could often be smiling at us and so on. And we had this, this tension about um, this is a Christian practice and our, some of our people are not Christian. And so is that going to be a barrier? And someone said to him, do we have to teach this as a Christian practice? And Thomas said, you teach people the silence. God is in the silence. And I think you heard Kat earlier let you know that that is exactly what happens for many, many people who have, um, who have not re been received in a loving way by the religion that they grew up in or by the families that they grew up in. So he gave us that kind of support and we were very, very grateful to that and we started revising the intro program. And um, the second year we were there, Tom S., who is the co-author of the book, Divine Therapy and Addiction, with Thomas Keating. Um, we have a picture of him with the PowerPoint that we did in 12-step language that we showed to Father Thomas. And he was just delighted with it. And we were delighted with it. And so um, we were off to uh, share with our groups of people. So as um, Mark said earlier, the point is that we are teaching what Father Thomas taught us, but we're using the 12-step language to reach our people in order to do that. And our mission is that we are 12-step people who practice centering prayer as our 11th step and pass it on to others in 12-step recovery. And for those of you who are not familiar with the 12 steps, the 11th step says, 
sought through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with God. As we understood him, praying only for the knowledge of his will for us and the power to carry that out. So we were sharing our experience with centering prayer as a way of doing the 11th step, although it really intersects with almost all of the 12 steps, each, each of the individual 12 steps. So eventually in our service team formation, we um, were able to develop a brochure and we were grateful to the prison ministry at that time because they had a booklet called um, Locked Up and Free. And we used that as a prototype to develop ours. And we have a booklet or we have a brochure now that um, is available to you. I'll tell you where in just a minute, but on the back page of that, it says, this pamphlet was put together to help those searching for emotional and spiritual sobriety. Centering prayer is a method for doing the 11th step to improve our conscious contact with our higher power, sought through prayer and meditation, fosters our own personal effort to communicate with a higher power. Many people in 12-step programs have deepened their relationship with their higher power with the, me with the method of centering prayer. So just to let you know, um, when I do intro workshops in um, the, the valley where I live now, the Roaring Fork Valley, many times I look out and I see people from 12-step programs or meetings that I've been to who are in the audience. And I always have some of these brochures available for people in the audience. And when, I'd encourage you, um, if we ever get back to doing in-person um, <laughs> Uh, intro workshops that you have the same thing because 12 step people aren't necessarily going to let you know who they are but if you have brochures available they'll take it um, in the way that they understand it and I almost always say um, this is a Christian based practice but you do not have to be Christian in order for this to be an effective way of enhancing your relationship with the God of your understanding so with these brochures, they are available on um, the web page. You can download them yourselves and make copies however many you need. You can take them to a printer and make copies. They're available in that way. And they're also available in our bookstore. And they're available for free, although you have to pay the postage. You can get a bundle of 25 Actually, you can get about 100 in bundles of 25 for maybe $8 worth of postage. And a couple of years ago, I got, I had the opportunity to work with Maru, who you met um, the first night doing the seven um, movements of centering prayer. And of course, she speaks Spanish very well. Well, she translated this into Spanish. And then um, we worked with Myrna, who is another ECI person, to do the layout. And we had these made in Spanish and they're also available in the bookstore and on the web page. And we would welcome any of the international groups who would like to translate this brochure into their particular language. We can support you financially. We've had some wonderful benefactors um, if you want to do that particular thing. So I'm gonna turn it over to Jim and he's gonna tell you more about um, our service team and our, what we're doing. Great. Um, I'm going to assume you guys can hear me. And I just want to say, like Jenny said, yes, so uh, privileged and honored to be able to speak to you today about 12 step outreach. And uh, I certainly want to thank Keith and Colleen for their wonderful work um, uh, reaching people that probably we don't reach out to enough, the younger people. Um, and Hampton and Chandra, beautiful presentations. It was so meaningful. Uh, your work is so vitally important to so many. And Lawrence and Ket, um, um, I feel one with you guys. I, I could relate uh, to everything you guys were talking about. Your 
your struggles, your recovery, your finding God within, it was absolutely so touching. And I don't think you will ever know in this lifetime how much your how 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 much your words touch so many people. It was absolutely beautiful. Um, Jenny gave a great history of twelve step outreach. I will just say a little bit. I I was born and raised uh, in St. Louis and got into recovery in um, the mid nineteen eighties, and I I immediately uh, knew that uh, twelve step recovery was where I was meant to be, and I remain there. I still am an active member of Alcoholics Anonymous, Al-Anon, and um, um, I consider myself to be a recovering addict and alcoholic, and I'm um, so grateful uh, for that recovery. So I was sober for about 10 years, and um, in 1996, um, I was introduced to Centering Prayer um, through an introductory workshop that was given to one of my, the AA meeting that I was going to, um, uh, Matthew F. was uh, just a, a wonderful friend at that time. And he had been, actually he lived in, in Aspen in the 1990s and got introduced to Thomas Keating and Pat Johnson and was um, um, interested in he was interested in teaching centering prayer um, to the 12 step community and was also a chapter coordinator of contemplative outreach of St. Louis. Matthew got to know a gentleman that Jenny mentioned already by the name of Donald Masters. And Matthew invited Donald Masters to lead a retreat in St. Louis, which was my real first introduction to a, some, a man in recovery, um, a, a recovering alcoholic who was practicing centering prayer. And that was a watershed experience. I had taken an introductory workshop in the 1980s, but, um, uh, um, excuse me, I, I had taken an introductory workshop in, in around 1996, but I had never really met that many people who were practicing centering prayer as an 11 step practice. But Donald comes to St. Louis. Donald was a friend of Thomas Keating, Pat Johnson. He was coming to retreats in the 1990s. And Matt knew that he was somebody special, and Donald was. And um, Contemplative Outreach of St. Louis offered this retreat for Donald Masters to come and for the first time invite a group of people in recovery to hear about centering prayer. And that happened in the year 2000. That was such a, a, a watershed experience for me because I wanna tell you what Donald Masters spoke on on the very first night he was there. He stood up and he said, I am a recovering alcoholic and I have struggled with my recovery. It's not been an easy road. I've been in recovery for more than 30 years and my, my sobriety has been broken by periods of relapse. And he said, I always knew that the 11th step in developing a deeper relationship with God was the key, but he goes, I never knew how to do it. And then he found out about Thomas Keating and the retreats in Snowmass. And one day he had the opportunity to meet with Father Thomas on an individual basis. And he told Thomas his story. And he said to Thomas, he said, Thomas, when I sit down in meditation, he goes, I'm a Vietnam vet. I struggle with post-traumatic stress disorder. I have a chronic pain syndrome. And he said, when I sit down in centering prayer, he goes, he says, he says, the the pain that goes through my body, he said, this is what he said. He said, it's like a freight train goes through my body when I sit down in silence. And Thomas responded, he said, well, Donald, I suggest that you use your pain as your sacred word. And Donald said, in that moment, he realized all of his life 
he had been running from pain, that he had always been trying to control his pain, that he had taken medication, too much medication, always running from pain. And he thought somehow meditation was a way to get out of pain. And he said, for the first time in my life, I realized that it's about embracing, it's embracing my experience. And he said that changed everything. And that night, when Donald told that story, I knew he was telling my story, that I had been running from pain, emotional and physical pain, all of my life. And that I would, and it opened up a whole new concept of being receptive, being receptive, bearing, being receptive, and allow God to get into my experience, God sharing my experience of my humanity with me. And that transformed everything. And Donald Masters was a great teacher for me. So that was my introduction to centering prayer as a recovering man. And I am so grateful for this journey. One of the reasons that we feel so powerful and so strongly about teaching centering prayer as an 11 step practice is because in all of the AA and recovery literature, there's really no method. So we thought center the, 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 the way Thomas Keating teaches centering prayer and the way it's offered would be so helpful to the 12 step community. And in the last 20 to 25 years, we have found that absolutely so. So um, we have a method that is accessible and um, um, people in 12 step recovery seem to latch onto it very, very well. Um, the other thing I think that attracted me to the idea of centering prayer was the idea of healing the wounds of a lifetime the healing, the unconscious, the unloading process, the um, evacuation. And in 12-step recovery, we do inventories. If anybody's familiar with our work, we do inventories, we share it with other people. But in centering prayer, we go deeper. We heal the wounds of a lifetime. And that's what centering prayer, I believe, really offers to the 12-step community. Um, I'd like just to, to mention that we have our own website that, that, that Jenny talked about, www.cp12stepoutreach.org. We have so much material on our website, including stories of people in recovery. We have all the events, all of our meetings. We have two types of meetings in 12-step outreach. We have um, 11 step meetings, which, um, are officially recognized and, and on, on the uh, AA uh, websites. There's 11 step, we don't talk about centering prayer, but these are 11 step meetings where we practice mostly 11, uh, excuse me, 20 minutes of silence and then have a speaker and then sharing. So those are 11 step meetings. And we also have 12 step centering prayer groups. And those are not a officially recognized by AA in any way, but these are 12-step people who come together and read and study and talk about the writings of contemplative outreach or other contemplative material. So those are the two types of uh, meetings that we share. And we have meetings literally all over the world, uh, mostly in the United States, but certainly all over the United States, some in Europe. And um, so, um, all those meetings are listed on our website. I also wanna mention our fall spirituality season. Um, we started this during the pandemic and we're very excited about this. We've had some very successful series. Uh, we also had a very successful 12-step um, sponsored retreat last summer. Um, and some of those videos, I believe, are still on our website. And we had some wonderful teachers on that. But our fall spirituality series will start on September 25th. We tried to time it so our European friends can join us. It'll be four consecutive Saturdays starting on, again, 
September 25th. And uh, we have some international presenters, which we're really excited about. We'll have the first and second conference on September 25th, and then the, sec the third and fourth conference on October 2nd. And then on October 9th, the entire faculty of the welcoming prayer of contemplative outreach, um, which includes Cherry Haston, Mary Dwyer, D Dave Dierig, Mary Lapham, and myself, we will be giving a teaching on the welcoming prayer, which will be a part of this series. The welcoming prayer, for those of you who don't know, is a companion practice to centering prayer. And we teach um, this, um, it's, it, we call it the consent on the go. So it's a companion practice. It's very helpful. We teach it in both, you know, uh, regular, regular language and in the 12 step culture and language that that Jenny was talking about. So and then the final session will be uh, a whole uh, period on um, it'll be on the forgiveness prayer. And um, the forgiveness prayer is a very powerful contemplative practice, and we're very excited to be introducing that to our fall series. So that starts, and you can you can register on our website, which is already listed. So I'm going to look back on a couple of notes and see if there's anything else I may have missed. I uh, oh, I, I did want to mention about twelve step outreach and working with the contemplative outreach chapters. And what I want to say is that um, there's there's the potential of a great relationship with all of our service teams working with our chapters, and they can be mutually helpful um, financially um, in in advertising our events. Um, you know, most of our 12 step events are uh, open to everybody. So we have people in a, who are not necessarily in a 12 step program. They oftentimes will participate in our retreats and our workshops. And the same is true. The people in 12 step recovery many times will join the great opportunities that contemplative outreach through retreats and speakers. And so there's a wonderful relationship between 12-step outreach. And in fact, some of our leaders of our local chapters are in 12-step outreach as well and in 12-step recovery. So there, there can be that potential. And, and I would suggest to anybody who's listening to this, who might not be connected to a local contemplative outreach chapter, but you're interested in the work that we do through 12-step outreach, I would definitely suggest that you contact your chapter find out what's going on and tell them maybe that you're interested in starting a local 11 step meeting or 12 step centering prayer group and see if they're see what's available and the last thing i want to say is we're always looking at formation there's always a need for people who have been touched by centering prayer um, and feel the call or an, even just a, an inclination to, could I be a presenter? Could I teach this? And oftentimes the local chapter and the 12 step outreach team will work together for formation. Usually people go through the standard contemplative outreach formation and then have an additional day or two of instruction to make sure that they really understand the 12 step language and culture and they're able to present that but oftentimes we work together in our formations and I would certainly recommend that anybody who's interested in becoming a 12 step centering prayer presenter to please explore that you know contact us and we, 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 we would love to tell you more about it so I think my time is about up Jenny I'm just going to if there's anything that you feel like you would like to uh, put the cherry on top, please do. Thank you so much for listening. Jim, thank you so much. And Jenny, thank you as well. Uh, we really appreciate you guys being here today and sharing this good work that you're doing and what's available to many of us who may not be aware of that at all. Thank you so much. We're gonna take a short break in just a few minutes. Um, we have a... Um, and after the break, we'll have time for a conversation in small groups and hope to come back in the large group for some questions or comments with the presenters. 
Before we do that, though, we want we do want to hear about the senior contemplatives, and we have a short video uh, talking about what's happening with senior contemplatives. Um, so um, we'll show the video first, and then we'll go into a break. And the video is by Sean Cafeter, who is an ordained non-denominational Christian minister, a licensed mental health counselor, and a certified expressive arts therapist. He has engaged in various contemplative practices, including centering prayer for over 30 years. Sean has spent most of his professional career as a geriatric chaplain. Sean recently retired from his full-time ministry and lives in Crone Point, Indiana, and he is involved in bringing centering prayer to the senior community. So with that, we'll uh, show this short video and then we'll head into a 10 minute break. We'll put the timer up for you so you can track the break time. Hello, I'm Sean Cafeter. I've spent most of my professional career in geriatric ministry as a chaplain and as a clinical counselor. One of the joys of my ministry has been introducing the gift of centering prayer to the seniors that I have worked with. As one ages, one naturally becomes more reflective and contemplative in life. The aging process can have an effect of softening our personality and softening our soul. Father Thomas Keating often said in various ways that if the spiritual journey does not transform us, the very journey of life will. When introducing Centering Prayer to the senior community, some will find a new resource for deepening their spiritual journey. If I were to begin exploring offering a centering prayer ministry to a senior community, I would begin by visiting a local retirement community, a local senior center, or a congregation that has an active senior ministry. Make an appointment with the person that schedules all of the activities. And when you meet with that person, ask them for a regular meeting place and a regular meeting time for your centering prayer group. You might also explore with that person the option of offering a taste of silence or a taste of centering prayer program. This is the time to introduce yourself to the community that you might be working with and the seniors who might be interested in the gift of centering prayer. It is also a time to tell your personal centering prayer story. It's a wonderful time to emphasize God's gracious invitation to be still and know that I am God. It is a time to offer a brief time of silence for those who attend and then to see their reaction to that gift of silence, the very experience of being in silence, sometimes for the very first time. And finally, this is a wonderful opportunity to advertise your centering prayer group and invite those who attend and their friends and neighbors to come to the group as well. When you have a small group of seniors who are interested in attending your centering prayer group, you might consider offering an introductory workshop. Unlike a traditional introductory workshop, you may offer each of the four conferences one at a time, one week at a time, at the time and place where your centering prayer group is going to meet. Make a 20-minute centering prayer sit a part of each of these introductory workshops. As your ministry grows, plan to offer this type of introductory workshop at least annually, if not more often. Your group may attract a constant flow of new attendees who are interested in learning about centering prayer. And your members may need reminders of the centering prayer method as well. Seniors don't need anything complicated. 
so keep your senior centering prayer fairly simple. Also remember that seniors may not be able to sit for a long program, so 30, 40, 45 minutes at the most might be enough for a senior centering prayer group. You may attract all kinds of participants to your group, so always be welcoming and always be hospitable to those who come to explore centering prayer. A good format for a senior centering prayer group might be a welcome to the group by the one who leads it, a sharing among those who are attending, maybe about what life has been like since the last time the group met, a sharing of a scripture verse or two, just a short reading, 20 minutes of centering prayer, a reflective reading from something about centering prayer, perhaps from Thomas Keating's open mind, open heart, and then a closing prayer or a blessing. I'm sure your participants will want to stay around and fellowship for a while. But a good thing to remember is to make anything that you print for your cent centering prayer group in large font and in clear print and print it on white paper, preferably. Over my years of leading senior centering prayer groups, I have compiled a resource, not only for senior groups, but for any centering prayer group. The title of my resource is 82 Centering Prayer Sessions for Groups and Individuals. It's a simple group format printed in large print that could be used with any centering prayer group or by those who attend the group as well. The resource is available for free. I only ask that if you print out the resource that you give me credit for compiling it. On one occasion, while I had the privilege of being on retreat at Snowmass, I was able to meet with Father Thomas Keating and share this resource. He loved it. He was leafing through the resource and reading parts of it when he looked up and he said, this looks very familiar. To which I replied, Father Thomas, it should. You wrote most of it. Father Thomas gave me his blessing to share this resource, however it would be useful in our Centering Prayer community. This is a wonderful and exciting ministry, a Centering Prayer group with seniors. You may find that many seniors that you work with are naturals at Centering Prayer. If you feel called to this ministry, I offer you my personal blessing. You're going to find that there is excitement as you share Centering Prayer with seniors and as you invite them to deepen their spiritual journey. God's blessings as you share Centering Prayer with the seniors of your community.